Greek island holidays. Can I help you? Yes, I hope so. I have a friend who's just come back from Corfu, and she's recommended some apartments in Aralus. She thought they might be on your list. Aralus, Aralus. Let me see.、Uh, can you give me the names? Yes, the first Rose Garden Apartments. I'd like to go with another friend in the last week of October. Well, we've got a lovely studio flat available at that time. I'm sure you'd enjoy the entertainment program there too, with Greek dancing in the restaurant. And the cost for each of us? Two hundred and nineteen pounds. That sounds very reasonable. I'm just jotting down some notes now. The second one she mentioned was called Blue Bay. Blue Bay. Yes, in fact, that's very popular, and it has some special features. Really? The main attraction is the large swimming pool with salt water.、Mm, much healthier, I understand. That's right, and it isn't far from the beach either. Only three hundred meters, and only around half a kilometer to some shops. So you don't have to be too energetic. Is it much more expensive than the first one? Let me just check. I think at the time you want to go, it's around two hundred and sixty pounds.、Uh, no, two hundred and seventy-five pounds to be exact. Right, I've got that. Now there are just two more apartments to ask you about. Um, I can't read my own writing. Something to do with sun, sunshine, is it? I think you meant the sunshade apartments. They're on a mountainside. Any special features? Yes, each room has its own sun terrace. And there are shared barbecue facilities. Oh, sounds lovely. Yes, it is rather well equipped. It also provides water sports. It has its own beach. There are facilities for water skiing. Any kite surfing? My friend's quite keen. Not at the hotel, but I'm sure you'll find some in Arilus. There's also satellite TV in the apartments. And how much is that one? Four hundred and ninety pounds with two sharing. You mean two hundred and forty-five pounds each? I'm afraid not. Each person has to pay that amount, and there must be at least two in an apartment. Oh, I don't think that would be within our budget, unfortunately. And the last one sounds a bit expensive too. The grand? Actually, it's quite reasonable. It's an older style house with Greek paintings in every room and a balcony outside. Sounds nice. What are the views like? Well, there are forests all round, and they hide a supermarket just down the road, so that's very useful for all your shopping needs.、Uh, there's a disco in the area too. And the price? Three hundred and nineteen pounds at that time, but if you leave it till November, it goes down by forty percent.、Mm, too late, I'm afraid. Well, why don't I send you a brochure with full details, Miss Nash? But don't worry about that. I'm coming to Upminster soon, and I'll call and get one. I just wanted to get an idea first. Well, that's fine.、Uh, we've got plenty here when you come. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. If you've got a minute, could I just check a couple of points about insurance? I got one policy through the post, but I'd like to see if yours is better. Fine.、Uh, what would you like to know? Well, the one I've got has benefits, and then the maximum amount you can claim. Is that like yours? Yes, that's how most of them are. Well, the first thing is cancellation. If the holiday's cancelled on the policy I've got, you can claim eight thousand pounds. We can improve on that, Miss Nash.、Uh, for Greek island holidays, our maximum is ten thousand pounds. That's good. Of course, our holiday won't even cost one thousand pounds together. It's still sensible to have good cover. Now, if you go to hospital, we allow six hundred pounds. Yes, mine's similar. And we also allow a relative to travel to your holiday resort. My policy just says their representative will help you. You can see there's another difference there. And what happens if you don't get on the plane?、Uh, nothing, as far as I can see on this form. Don't you have、uh, missed departure? No, I'll just jot that down. We pay up to a thousand pounds for that, depending on the reason, and we're particularly generous about loss of personal belongings, up to three thousand pounds, but not more than five hundred pounds for a single item. Then I'd better not take my laptop. Not unless you insure it separately. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. You've really been helpful. Can I get back to you? Your name is Ben Ludlow. That's L U D L O W. I'm the assistant manager here. I'll give you my number. It's O eight one. Two six zero five four three two one six. But didn't I phone zero eight one two six zero five six seven two nine four? That's what I've got on the paper. That's the main switchboard. I've given you my direct line. Right. Thank you very much for your time. That is the end of section one. Section two. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. For the second in our series about locally run businesses, we meet Simon Winridge, co-founder of the hugely successful Winridge Forest Railway Park. Welcome, Simon. 
Now, perhaps you can begin by telling us a little bit about how it all started. Well, during the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land, and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon, we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. I dealt with park business and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock. Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with 50,000 visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that, after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction – and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs. Mm -hmm. So have you finished your development of the site for the moment? Not at all. We're constantly looking for ways to offer more to our visitors. Mm -hmm. The railway remains the central feature, and there's now 1.2 kilometres of the line laid, but we'd like to lay more. Because of the geology of the area, our greatest problem is digging tunnels but we're gradually overcoming that. We're also very pleased with a new installation of the go-kart arena, which is 120 square metres in area. Oh. Again, the problem is the geology. We had to level the mounds on the track for safety reasons. We wanted to enable 5- to 12-year-olds to use the go-karts. And the main attraction here is the Formula One kart. We've known fights to break out over who gets it. <laughs> and then, finally, to our most recent development, which is the landscape swimming pool. That is the end of section two. Section three. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Ah, Caroline. Come on in, sit down. Thanks. So how's the dissertation planning going? Well, Dr. Shulman, I'm still having a lot of trouble deciding on a title. Well, that's perfectly normal at this stage. And this is what your tutorials will help you to do. Right. What we'll do is jot down some points that might help you in your decision. First of all, you have chosen your general topic area, haven't you? Yes, it's the fishing industry. Oh, yes, that was one of the areas you mentioned. Now, what aspects of the course are you good at? Well, I think I'm coping well with statistics, and I'm never bored by it. Good. Anything else? Well, I found computer modelling fascinating. Mm -hmm. I have no problem following what's being taught, whereas quite a few of my classmates find it difficult. Well, that's very good. Do you think these might be areas you could bring into your dissertation? Oh, yes, if possible. It's just that I'm having difficulty thinking how I can do that. You see, I feel I don't have sufficient background information. I see. Well, do you take notes? Uh, I'm very weak at note-taking. Mm -hmm. My teachers always used to say that. Well, I think you really need to work on these weaknesses before you go any further. What do you suggest? Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Well, I can go through the possible strategies with you and let you decide where to go from there. OK, thanks. Well, some people find it helpful to organize peer group discussions. You know, each week a different person studies a different topic and shares it with the group. Oh, right. It really helps build confidence. Yeah. You know, having to present something to others. I can see that. The drawback is that everyone in the group seems to share the same ideas. They keep being repeated in all the dissertations. OK. 
You could also try a service called Student Support. Mm -hmm. It's designed to give you a structured program over a number of weeks to develop your skills. Sounds good. Yes. Unfortunately, there are only a few places. Ah. But it's worth looking into. Yes, of course. I know I've got to work on my study skills. And then there are several study skills books you can consult. Right. They'll be a good source of reference. But the problem is, they are sometimes too general. Yes, that's what I've found. Other than that, uh, I would strongly advise quite simple ideas, uh, like using a card index. Well, yes, I've never done that before. Oh, it's simple, but it really works because you have to get points down in a small space. Hmm. Another thing I always advise is don't just take your notes and forget about them. Read everything three times. That'll really fix them in your mind. Yes. I can see it to take discipline, but... Well, if you establish good study skills at this stage, they'll be with you all your life. Oh, yes, I completely agree. Mm. It's just that I don't seem to be able to discipline myself. I need to talk things over. Mm, well, uh, we'll be continuing these tutorials, of course. Uh, let's arrange next month's now. Let's see. Um, I can see you virtually any time during the week starting uh, the 22nd of January. Um... What about the 24th? I'm mm. free in the afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm booked then. Mm. Uh, what about the following day? Uh, the first day? Yeah. I can make the morning. Fine. We'll go for the 25th then. That's great. Thanks. That is the end of Section 3. Section 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. In the last few lectures... I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners, both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible. But at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer, either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping south-facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future, the house may even generate an electricity surplus and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood, and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, 
one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared, and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything, environmentally I mean, because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco-housing like this is likely to become...